so we start uh well, this is the third webinar. I think this is unprecedented because we have uh, three webinars on one topic. Uh, but it's a third webinar on circular motion. So I'm going through, uh, I've chosen three relatively easy problems uh, and three harder problems today. They're not just on circular motion. Some of them are a little bit wider, especially the last one, but hopefully, uh, it, it starts to make sense. Can ev can people hear me? Uh, I assume they can. I assume you can hear me. Oh, brilliant. And okay, so also I would like to, you to ask questions. Maybe uh, ask me about something you really didn't understand from the assignment. Don't worry uh, if you're don't worry asking a silly question. I mean, there are no, no such things as silly questions. So just, um, just if you have a question, ask me. Okay. Don't 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 be afraid to uh, ask questions. Okay. Uh, like for example, for example, I uh, uh, I had a I had a gap in my education. For example, I did not know how to complete the square until um, until I was much older than it was supposed to be, until I was probably 18 or 19. Whereas completing the square should, should be obvious. I just avoided it whenever I could do it differently. I did it differently without completing the square, which is uh, which now seems silly, but um, I was afraid to ask. I was afraid to ask, uh, how do you complete a square? Because I was supposed to know that when everybody around me knew that. Okay, anyways, uh, let's start. Um, I'll share my screen. I've got six questions for you today. Problem one. A point mass is accelerating uniformly from rest on a circular track of radius 20 centimeters. The tangential acceleration is tangential acceleration is five centimeters per second squared. Uh, notice the unusual units. Uh, normally you, you could just convert that into standard units, into SI units. You don't have to. Uh, you can work in centimeters, that's, that, that's fine. Uh, the mass acceleration uniformly from rest on a circular track, the tangential tangential acceleration is five centimeters per second squared, at which time will the normal acceleration be double that of the tangential acceleration? Okay, so we've discussed this. We've discussed that when you're moving in a circle, uh, okay, when you're moving in a circle in A levels, you, you always have, uh, you usually have constant speed. But if you're moving in a circle, as a general rule, you have two types of acceleration. Acceleration along the path, which we call tangential acceleration, and normal acceleration, normal. The tangential acceleration doesn't have to be forward. If you are slowing down, it's backwards. Uh, so the normal acceleration is equal to V squared over R or omega squared r. And the tangential acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So delta v divided by delta t, where v is the speed. Yeah, so this is not a vector. But it's very important to understand this. This is the change of speed, not the change of velocity. Because the change of, because the overall acceleration, acceleration is, change of velocity divided by change of time, which is incidentally the, the normal vector plus the tangential vector. So this is a scalar. This is a scalar. And because the vector is, the, is this vector. I hope that makes sense. 
So if you do it with a vector, it's the full acceleration. It's the full acceleration because the velocity is changing direction as well as changing the uh, as well as changing the magnitude. Here, this is a simple simplified version where we look at the two accelerations separately, which is very useful. Okay, so we know that we know we know we know that. Now, the tangential acceleration tangential acceleration is constant, so it's always equal to that. So that doesn't change. So we need to at what time will the normal acceleration be double the tangential acceleration? So basically, we have the normal acceleration, which is equal to v squared over r squared over r and that that must be equal to times the tangential tangential acceleration and this is constant so this is going to be 10 meter 10 centimeters 10 centimeters per second squared or 0 0.1 meter per second squared maybe that's easier um, I'm just going to put this in brackets because maybe, maybe uh, that's uh, that change that putting in the numbers too early. It might be, just might be that we don't need that yet. Okay, now velocity. Velocity is very easy. You can use a SUVAT to find the the speed, the, to find the speed along along the the track. Uh, you can use a simple SUVAT equals U uh, plus tangential acceleration times T uh, from rest. So initial, initial speed is zero. So that is A tangential times time. And we plug that into here. We plug that into here. So we get a tangential squared t squared divided by r. So we are we are using this equation, and that is equal to two a tau. Now a tau cancels, and we are left with t is equal to uh, two r divided by a tau, a tau, uh, square rooted, square rooted. So that's two times the radius is 0 0.2 meters, divided by a tau is 0 0.05 meters per second squared. And that gives us, Two square roots of two seconds, two square roots of two, which is approximately 2.83 seconds. 2.83 seconds. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions here? We've got We've got one minute to spend on this question. One extra minute, if that's needed. No, actually more. We've got 15 minutes per question. Right. Any questions? Not at all. Okay, so uh, hopefully you understand. Another thing is, um, there, there are these two types of acceleration, but there's also the angular acceleration, alpha. So what is angular acceleration in this case? Well, angular acceleration is is measured in radians per second, uh, radians per second uh, uh, radians per second squared. Yeah, radians per second per second. So it's the change of angular velocity divided by change of time. And we know that angular velocity is 
um, is re regular velocity. So it's we know that omega is v divided by r, which is and that means that delta omega is delta v divided by r because r is not changing r is a constant so we are allowed to do this so it's delta v divided by r delta t and delta v divided by delta t is a tau a tangential divided by r so that is what uh, angular acceleration is and angular acceleration in this case is 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.2, uh, which is a quarter, 0 0.2525 radians per second squared. Right. This means that every second, it is increasing by uh 0 0.2 the speed is increasing by the angular speed is increasing by 0 0.25 radians per second okay so please make sure that you understand all three types of acceleration or three type of acceleration the angular acceleration which is, which is linked to tangential acceleration the tangential acceleration and the normal acceleration or the centripetal acceleration as we call it normally normally okay uh, problem two is about planet earth again and it's a very similar uh, i think we've done a very similar question in the first webinar at what latitude is the tangential speed of a point due to earth's rotation 200 meters per second less than it is in Los Angeles. And the latitude of Los Angeles is 34, um, th 34 degrees north latitude. And here's just a reference for you, just for you to, to understand what we're talking about. So uh, we have different points of the planet moving at different velocities. And Los Angeles, well, it's actually quite about here, 34 degrees. And they say that it's moving with some, some kind of speed. This table says it's about this much, yeah, which is about, uh, what, 500, 500 meters per second? A little bit less than that. And so it's about, about 480, let's say. So 480 and somewhere uh, the further north you go, the smaller the speed. So somewhere here, the speed is going to be 280. 280 and 280. And that's what we're trying, what we're trying to find is the latitude. is quite important to understand latitude and longitude. Uh, so this is the planet Earth. This is the equator. These are the poles. The Earth rotates anticlockwise. And the angular, well, we'll need the angular speed of the Earth. The angular speed of the Earth is 2 pi divided by the time period. Uh, so it's 2 pi divided by the time period. And time period is 24 hours. 24 times 60 times 60. OK, you can have access to the whiteboard. So you can have a look, you, you can look at it in real time. 
what at what latitude lambda is the tangential speed of a point due to earth rotation 200 meters per second less than it is in los angeles you can use the link i sent the link gives you access to the whiteboard um right so well let's let's label los angeles first los angeles this is from Feynman's lectures hence los angeles i would have chosen london uh, so 34 degrees. Let's call this, let's call this uh, alpha. Well, let's call it theta. Theta. And at this location, the speed is V1. V1. And somewhere here, when the angle is lambda, the speed is V2. Now to get the speed, we need the radius of the small circle. And we'll call this R1, or R2, sorry. And this is, this is going to be R1, R1, the radius of this circle. Because if you're standing here in Los Angeles, you're moving in a circle of radius R1, if you're standing here, you're moving in a circle of radius R2. Let's find the link. So let's say this is the circle you're moving in, and this is the center of the planet. If you draw a line like this, and you draw a line like this, this is the axis of rotation. And this angle is your latitude. So let's say theta. And this is the radius of the planet. This is the radius of the planet. Therefore, this this little this side, this side is going to be. What's the length of this side using trigonometry? Help me out. Using trig. R cross theta. R cross theta. Yes, of course. Thank you. R cos theta. So the radius is R cos theta. So we can say R1 is R cos theta. And R2 is R cos lambda. Lambda is the one, with the, the one we're looking for. OK. We know that omega is the same, the omega because omega is linked to the time period. So omega is um, omega is the same, and we can say that uh, we know that omega is equal to v divided by r, small r in this case, v divided by r. And, and they have the same um, they have the same omega. Well, I mean, from here we can write v equals omega r, and we can use this. We can use this result to say that v one is going to be omega r one r one, which is omega r cos theta and v2 is equal to omega r2 which is omega r cos lambda cos lambda and they say that v2 is 200 meters per second slower than v1 so v2 is equal to v1 minus 200 meters per second minus 200 okay now we can we can plug that plug that in so we have v2 which is omega r cos lambda equals 
uh, omega r cos theta minus 200. So cos lambda is equal to cos theta minus 200 divided by omega r. Now you can always assume that you know the radius of the planet unless you, you unless they're asking you to find the radius of the planet you assume that you know it so it's going to be cos 34 cos 34 minus 200 divided by omega oh sorry i did not uh, i forgot to calculate omega Omega, this is a standard result. So 2 pi divided by 24 times 60 times 60, 7.27, 27 times 10 to the minus 5 radians per second. divided by omega which is 7.27 times 10 to the minus 5 multiplied by the radius of the planet and the radius of the planet you should know 6400 kilometers so it's 6, 6 million 400 thousand meters and you get cos 34 minus fraction 200 divided by answer times 6400000 and you get 0 0.3993 and then you take our cos of that so lambda arc cos uh, 0 0.3993 which is approximately 66 66 point 1.46 point 0.5 degrees north or or, or south it, i mean the uh, point sixty six degrees uh, north and south is the same thing. I think. I think. Um, I'm thinking Aberdeen is about sixty degrees. Mm, I, I, I don't want to lie, but it's 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 quite north. It's it's quite far north. Quite far north. Um, Oh, nice. Uh, this is a, one uh, city I really want to go to. Uh, and I've only been... You should. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I, I know. I know. <laughs> I will. I definitely will. And uh, yes, uh, I've only been as far north as Fort, Fort, Will, Fort Williams. Fort William? uh, oh, the West Coast. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, so I think I think that's about sixty degrees north, and if you go further, so it's further north, sixty six point five degrees north. Um, well, actually, why don't we check it? Fifty seven, fifty seven. So so it's quite it's further north much further north than Aberdeen. So for, for reference, Edinburgh is 56, Aberdeen is 57. So about three times, three times the distance from uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh to Aberdeen. Anyways, um, now this is a trick question. Uh, I guess just Google 
Google uh, Shetland Islands uh, longitude. It sh should, should be roughly, roughly that. A 235 horsepower car of mass 900 kilograms. It has the coefficient of friction with the, with the road is 0 0.3. Find the maximum acceleration of the car. Now, this is a tricky question because because it seems that it wants you to um, find the maximum power in watts and then apply this and find the maximum acceleration of the car. And if you go down this road, you will you will not get an answer because the acceleration of the car would be infinitely large. The maximum acceleration of the car. Um, well, we can we can we can try going down that road. Ah, Helsinki, nice. Uh, sixty. Helsinki. Well, yeah, it should be sixty because Saint Petersburg is sixty. Uh, and it's very close to Helsinki. To um, so and the, in reality, this is a, an incredibly easy question. Can somebody give me the answer without doing any calculations or doing very basic calculations? Can get, who can answer the question A? Just like that. Because it's very, Adam, very good. About three meters per second squared. Right, absolutely, then this is true. Can, uh, would you like to explain why, how you arrived to the answer? Can you, uh, can you use your mic to to explain if if you're happy to do that he's absolutely right and you remember my lectures from last year do you remember why you can use the mic can anyone explain is it um mu times g it is, but why? Oh, uh, I can't remember to be honest. Can't remember. Does anyone remember? Friction equals mu times normal reaction. Okay. Yes, the force of friction equals mu times normal reaction. Is it because it will start slipping beyond that? Uh, yes, because you are limited not by the horsepower of the car. You're you're limited always by the uh, by by the, by the coefficient of friction with the road. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Now the uh, the force of friction, the force of friction is mu n, which is on a horizontal road equals mu m g. Okay. And when the car starts moving, when the car starts moving, I'm not very good at drawing cars, but this is a race car. And these are the spoilers, the front and back spoilers. And it's supposed to be a race car. And when it's starting, the only force acting on acting horizontally is the friction and the fr it's a friction between the tires and the road and the friction has a forward direction 
They tell you friction is always, they, they always tell you that friction acts backwards. If you're moving forwards, the friction is backwards. That's not true. Friction causes, pushes the car forward because if, how else is the car moving? The car is starting and the wheels are pushing against the road. So if the wheels are pushing the road, that means the road is pushing the car. So the road is pushing the car forward and that force is equal to mu mg. And there are no other horizontal forces. Uh, Taiko, what do you mean? Sh friction can only match the movement. What does that, wh what do you mean by that? So look, you have a stationary car and the car starts moving. So there must be a force pushing the car. And that force is friction. And friction is mu mg. Therefore, the maximum force that accelerates the car is equal to mu mg. And if you use Newton's, uh, Newton's second law, mass acceleration is equal to mu mg. Because the maximum resultant force, if friction were more powerful than the motion, work out but what do you mean friction more powerful than motion that motion is motion we're talking about forces we have a we have a an object like we have a car and it's being pushed and f equals ma it's as simple as that ma f equals ma and the only and the force is friction and if we know that friction is mu n and we know n is mg because uh, because because of that because uh, we have mg acting downwards and we have normal reaction upwards and normal reaction and this is mg and so it comes mu mu n or mu mg and the mass cancels out. And we have acceleration of the car is equal to mu g. Because I mean the fr friction is a reactionary force. No. Well, yeah, I mean, if you if the wheels are not turning, I'm not I'm not sure what you mean, but if the wheels start turning, the acceleration is that you can have less acceleration, of course, but if you attempt to put more, if you attempt to put your foot down, the wheels will start turning. The wheel will start turning, and uh, the acceleration can't exceed this limit, mu mu g. And this is and, and this is a brilliant thing because when when they try to sell you a car, they say, "Oh, this car has like 17, 1700 horsepower, and it goes from zero to sixty in one point one second." And you say, "No, no, it doesn't." It because acceleration acceleration is always limited by 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 friction. If you don't have the friction, you won't accelerate. With, with really hot tires on a perfect surface, on a perfect Formula One track, like brand new, on a warm day with uh, on brand new tires, maybe you would be able to achieve the, the number that they claim. But on a normal road, in normal conditions, you're just limited by the by the tires, by the uh, by, by the road, and in this case, the the friction is quite slow. So this is like an icy road. Zero point three is 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 quite low. So the maximum acceleration. 
max. Well, we can say that acceleration max. We know that the friction force friction force, I'm just uh, going to elaborate, is less than or equal to mu m, which is mu mg, mg. And this is F max. So the ma is less than or equal to mu mg, and a is less than or equal to mu g. So when you are when you have a car and it's accelerating, this is the limit. Uh, right. So in this in this particular case, a max is equal to 0 0.3 times g. Well, let's say 10 for now, and it's equal to three meters per second squared. A very, a very easy solution, incredibly easy, and everything else just it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't 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 make any difference. Like this is completely useless. Okay. I did try to trick you a little here. Uh, find the maximum speed at which it can travel around a bend. Oh, uh, this is a 100 meter bend. Bend of radius. A radius equals 100 meters. Okay, so. Let's say you have a bend in a road and this, this picture is not very representative because this picture is clearly uh, less than 100 meters. But just for you to understand that this is the radius of a bend. And once again, in a bend, you're limited by the friction. Because if you don't have enough friction, the car won't turn. So assuming you're moving with constant speed around a bend. So this is your car. So we are looking at the car from the top. Looking at the car from the top. OK. Not very good at drawing cars either. From cars from the top either. Anyways, here's a car and it's traveling this way, and it is accelerating. It must be accelerating. It's accelerating towards the center. So the acceleration is that way. Acceleration. And so there must be a force towards the center of the track, and that force is, you guessed it, friction. Because if there was no friction, the car would travel in a straight line. The friction causes the car to turn. Uh, <laughs> oh, how do we know that it's like the so friction can't be the only pushing it forwards? Friction can't be for okay. <laughs> if you push the car, is the uh, no air resistance is limiting the car's maximum speed, not acceleration. The fr uh, the friction that is pu the friction is the grip that pushes the car forwards. Because if there was no grip. You would not be able to move. The wheels would spin and the car would be stationary. And that friction force has a maximum value of mu n, mu mg. And that's the maximum acceleration at which you can travel. Now, as you increase your speed, the air resistance increases. So you have resistive forces. There is another type of friction against the road, which is called rolling friction. But this is not this is not this is not the same as the force that pushes you forward. It's a different type of friction uh, that reduces the 
reduces the uh, prevents you from going forward. But the main the main thing is the air resistance. That's why the cars are so aerodynamic because air resistance plays a much bigger role than friction in terms of preventing you from from going too fast. So when air resistant matches your forward friction force, we, we, we say engine force, but the engine does not push the car forward. If the engine was actually pushing the car forward, it has to be an external force. The engine has to be behind the car and pushing the car forward. No, the engine is part of the car, so the engine cannot push the car forward. It's the road that does the trick. So the road pushes the car forward, and the air resistance pushes the car back. And when these forces are equal, you reach top speed. Why does the temperature matter? Because these, the rubber becomes softer and there's more grip. Right. More grip, so the coefficient of friction is bigger. That's what happens when the tires are warm. Now, going back to the corner. There's a friction force, so the, as the car going, the car is going around a bend, so there must be a friction force towards the center, because if there was no friction force, the car would just travel in a straight line off the road into the into the into the bush. Now, uh, friction force, and that friction force has to equal to mass acceleration, and surprise, surprise, the friction force is mu mg equals ma. And a, in this case, is v squared over r, because you're moving in a circle. m v squared over r. m cancels. And we got v equals mu g r square root. And once again, the maximum speed that the car can take around a corner, around a given corner, is equal to square root of mu gr. Once again, the mass of the car is not involved. The, well, okay. Uh, there's another limitation because, for example, if it's if it's a bus, it can topple over, and that's a, that's a, that's another story. So the 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 wheels might hold the bus, but it will not skid off the road, but it will topple over. So this is this is another th this is another thing to consider. But if we are assuming uh, that the the, uh, the car does not topple over, uh, I mean the the wheels would s start sliding first before toppling over the car. Basically, look if you if you take uh, if you take a cup and if i push the cup slides right it doesn't topple over but if there was mo more friction if there was more friction it would topple over rather than slide okay so we assume that the friction is not that large so it is uh, it doesn't topple over because then toppling over is a completely different story. Uh, but in terms of the grip limit, this is the maximum speed that you can, you can take around a corner without skidding, but not without toppling over. Maximum speed, maximum speed around a corner without sliding. Uh, I'd say the more friction, the better. It really depends on which type of friction you're talking about. Uh, you need a lot of friction, a lot of friction between the the tires and the road, but the you need very little friction in the in the axles. So these these are different. This is a different type of friction. The car should be very aerodynamic to be efficient. To be efficient, that's, that's that's the main thing. Problem four. Consider the same car from problem three. 
it accelerates uniformly. Oh, sorry, uh, the picture, what I was trying to, to show you. Now, if you look closely at this, uh, at the cars, I think this is, well, this, this is Formula One. I'm just wondering which one, uh, maybe Monaco, looks like Monaco. Uh, so basically you can see that the cars, they're not taking the shortest path because the shortest path would be, would be like this. And rather they're taking they're taking a path like this. They go wide, they go into the corner, they come out of the corner, they go wide again. And you can see, you can even see the dark lines. They go, they, they, they go wide again and they go like this. So they're not taking the shortest route, they're taking a wider route. And the reason is that because the radius is different. The radius of the red path is this, and the radius of the blue path is larger. So roughly like this radius. Radius increase, uh, so cars increase radius. radius of the curve because v max is equal to square root of mu r g and g is something you cannot control but r you uh, ra the radius you can control. You can take a bigger radius, and that means you can go. So bigger. If the radius increases, v increases as well. So you can you can go at a faster speed if you take a wider path. Uh, lower energy. Uh, Henry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Would this be lower? What does that mean? They increase the radius of the corner. Can I? Uh, yeah, if it's if it's uh, if it's uh, if you're talking about uh, efficiency, I mean, if the car is aerodynamic, yeah, less less work going through uh, going through the pushing the air away yeah because what what's, what's happening is when the car is traveling so the, there's a molecule of air that it changes direction so you, you're 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 transferring kinetic energy of the car to the to the kinetic energy of the molecules of air so you're losing energy uh, okay, problem four. Consider the car from problem three. It accelerates uniformly along a horizontal road in the shape of a one twelfth of a circle with a radius of 100 meters. So what we're talking about is, is there's a circle and there's a, there's a one twelfth of a circle, just like that. So we do that. Uh, yeah, but you won't, you don't, you don't win, you don't win by taking the, the shorter path, like not really, because you're just going too slow. Uh, I did some karting myself and, uh, the way to win was always to take the widest possible path. And not not the widest possible, the biggest radius. Yeah, you're not, you're not going on the outer edge. No, you you you, you use the whole track. Anyways, so this is from A to B. 
And now we have the same thing, but now we have acceleration, we have the tangential acceleration, and we have the normal acceleration as well. So we have, so when the car is midway, let's say here, it's accelerating this way. That's the normal acceleration, uh, tangential acceleration. And then there's the normal acceleration, A n. And okay, going from A to B, so we can find, we can use SUVAT for tangential acceleration. So A tangential is change in V divided by change in time. Not the best formula to use. Let's use a different one. So let's use V squared equal uh, minus equ equals U squared uh, plus two AS. That makes more sense. And then U is zero because it starts from rest. So V squared is equal to, and that's the speed at B, the final speed. Uh, V squared is equal to a s. Now s is it one twelfth of a circle, so it's two a multiplied by uh, a tangential, of course, tangential, uh, and s is two pi r divided by twelve. Simplify that, it becomes three. So a tau r multiplied by pi over three. And from here, I'm just looking to have, have messed anything up here. Um, okay, so from here, I can deduce that the tangential acceleration is equal to uh, 3v squared divided by pi r. The normal acceleration, on the other hand, as we already know, is V squared over R. Now, it is, they, it, they told us it's accelerating uniformly. That means this has to be constant. Constant. Uh, so there's a question, why do we use the tangential acceleration? Normal acceleration is only to do with turning, if that makes sense. And tangential acceleration is, is like traveling. So let's say you are, you're in a car and you're measuring speed and distance. Not velocity and displacement, you're, move, you're measuring speed and distance. So if the car is turning, that doesn't concern you. You're just looking at how far you traveled, if that makes sense. So if the car is accelerating, it's changing its speed. That's what you're interested in. Like, if you ask a runner, oh, that's a very that's a very good question. If you take if you ask a runner, uh, how what's what's their acceleration around us? What's their acceleration? And they say, well, I go from zero to ten meters per second in in five seconds. So my acceleration is two meters per second squared. they won't be able to tell you their centripetal acceleration. 
if that makes sense. Like, and it, it doesn't really matter. Like, you don't ask a runner, what's your centripetal acceleration? It, unless, unless it's a very small, it's a, unless it's a tiny track where you really struggle to, to turn, yeah, imagine running it in a circle of radius one meter. You won't be able to to run really very fast because you have to turn all the time. Uh, you'll be you'll be slipping off slipping. But uh, that's the that's the that's the thing. You you run in a uh, in you run in a uh, circle. So but when you when you ask someone. That's their tangential acceleration. Tangential acceleration is the normal acceleration people are used to. Uh, so in an everyday life, what's the acceleration of a car? It's, it's the tangential acceleration you, you're that asking you about, not the normal. And the normal acceleration the v squared over r always, by definition of circular, by well, it's not by definition. Of course, we've, we have proven that in the assignment, we have proved that. And you know that the total acceleration is equal to a tau squared plus a n squared square root, because it's the vector sum of the two. So if this is not tangential, so this is the acceleration of the car. So it's accelerating along the road and perpendicular to the road at the same time. And that is the acceleration, the total acceleration. We sub that in. So it's going to be uh, three V squared over pi R squared plus E squared over R squared. And it's v squared over r square root three over pi squared plus one. We simplify that. And we know that the maximum, we know that the maximum the acceleration is mu g. We know this from the previous results. Mu g. Uh, well, we know that this has to be less than or equal to mu g because the the tires is the only thing causing the car to accelerate. Uh, therefore, v max squared is well. Let's just do v max without without the square. So it's mu g r mu g r mu g r divided by square root of three over pi squared plus one and square root. It would probably be in orbit around you. You can use the resultant force equation to find Tangential acceleration might not be good. Very good. Can you use the resultant force? Well, yeah, you have the. Well, you have two. Well, you have you have one force, and the that force is friction, and the friction causes causes two things. It causes you to turn, and it causes you to move forward, and that's why you're limited. You're limited by the friction. You can't have. Well, yeah. Friction acts at an angle. It doesn't act along the track. It doesn't act perpendicular. It's both. Right. Any questions? Any questions here? I'd be happy to answer. I know it's a it's a tough one. Um, I thought that in the formula where it says uh, the normal acceleration equals v squared over r, I thought v is referring to just a speed, not necessarily the um, final 
speed. Ah, okay. True. The uh, we. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. I just need to explain that a bit better. At A, at A, A, we only have uh, A n is zero because the velocity is zero and the tangential acceleration is three three V squared over pi R, where V is the final, final speed. Okay. So basically we're looking, there are six questions. Basically we're looking at uh, the, uh, the final speed and we're adjusting our acceleration to match the, the final speed, if that makes sense. And at B, at B, the normal acceleration is equal to V squared over R, and the tangential acceleration is equal to three V squared over pi R. So we're limited at the very end, of course, uh, because we, we the acceleration is uniform. So you start with the lower acceleration. Uh, so you mean the tangential acceleration is the same throughout the journey, but the normal acceleration starts from zero and then uh, increasing. Yeah, there are six questions today. Uh, does that answer the question, uh, Tycho? Oh, sorry. Oh, that oh do you just do you just mean that um, you know, it has to be that a n equal v squared over r because it's we're considering if it works for the final point of the journey in which we've got maximum speed, it will automatically work for the rest of the journey. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, we are looking at the final point of the journey, and we are uh, saying that the maximum maximum speed, uh, maximum uh, acceleration. Oh, sorry, the the speed, the maximum speed you can obtain on this path. So basically, if you are the driver of a car, you you cannot put the pedal too much down because uh, even though in the beginning your acceleration is only tangential, at some point your normal your normal acceleration starts increasing, 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 and you will start sliding. You still slide, start sliding off the track at some point. Therefore, you have to choose the amount of acceleration that will allow you to safely go around the curve. So maybe that's what using only 60% of your engine's power, just going accelerating, to, because at the at the end you will you 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 might uh, just not be able to go. And uh, this this is a thing people do every day, every day on a country road. You have to consider how fast you are going. Therefore, you have to consider what kind of acceleration you can you can uh, you can go at. Right, problem five. Problem five is from Feynman lectures as well, and it's actually a photograph. I was uh, I was a bit lazy today. Uh, four masses uh, m in the same plane in the same uh, sorry in the same plane in field-free space connected by very light springs of spring constant k are spinning at angular velocity omega um, about an axis. So the springs are relaxed and, well, let's draw two scenarios. So first, Now here, 
The first case is when it's not spinning. So when this is zero. So let's say it's not spinning. So it's not spinning. And uh, we have the length of the spring is L, unstretched. And so this is L. Now, when it is spinning, we have L plus delta L. Uh, the, the springs. Okay. And let's look at the force, the forces acting on one of the masses. So because the spring is stretched, ah, I wanted to be cheeky. So when it's stretched, becomes becomes bigger. The square becomes bigger, the square expands. Okay, so now the side of the square is L plus delta L. Now we have the tension force acting downwards along this spring, and there's a tension force acting along this spring. This is T, and this is T. And we can write that well, T plus T, in this case, the resultant force. And the resultant force causes the mass to accelerate towards the center of the circle, acceleration. So mass acceleration is equal to T plus T. Well, you can, you can add the T using the parallelogram rule, and that's gonna be square root, two, square root of two T, square root of two T. And we know acceleration is equal to V squared over R. So M, no, actually, I'm not gonna use MV squared over R. I'm gonna use M omega squared R. M omega squared, well, let's use R. M omega squared R equals two, square root of two. And we know that T tension is K times delta L. K times the stretch of the spring. Uh, square root of two times K times delta L. Sorry, delta L, delta capital L. Delta L. Right. Now we need to find the radius. Where? The radius L divided by square root of two, almost. Yes, Henry, <laughs> you corrected yourself. L plus delta L, L plus delta L divided by square root of two. Uh, because, well, yeah, I mean, you find the diagonal, the diagonal is um, square root of two times L plus delta L, and then you divide it by two, you get L plus delta L divided by square, square root of two. So you plug that in, the radius, sorry. Uh, so that's going to be M omega, sorry, that's capital M. Let's use proper notation. M 
mega squared R, which is L plus delta L divided by square root of two equals square root of two A delta L. Uh, square root of two, we'll multiply, multiply this out. I'm gonna type because something's wrong with my with my pen. It's just not doing it right. So it's gonna be m omega squared l plus delta l equals two k delta l. And then we just rearrange. So m omega squared l plus m omega squared delta l equals 2k delta l. And just make delta L, L the subject, because that's what we are looking for. Delta L, and that is fraction, fraction M omega squared L divided by M omega squared. Uh, 2k, 2k minus that. Now, uh, these are latech, lat, latex, latech. We call it latech. Um, now, an interesting thing. You know, you know how I always give you the answer. In, in, in letters, and then I substitute the numbers. So I never, sub I, well, okay, I hardly ever substitute in the middle of the question. I always substitute, at, I always try to substitute at the very end. And this is, and this is why, if you look at this expression, like, have I messed up? Have I made a mistake here? Like, how do I know? How, how do I check? So uh, you, you, do, you do dimensions analysis. You, is, is, are the units consistent? So we know that K, we, we can only add things if they have this, the, the, the proper units. So we know that K is Newtons per meter, Newtons per meter. But we also knew, know that Newton is kilogram, kilogram meter per second squared, divided by meter. Therefore, this is kilogram kilogram second minus two. Now, what is m omega squared? m omega squared. Well, m is kilograms. So, m is kilograms multiplied by omega. And omega is radians per second. So basically, it's second minus two. Because radian is not a physical, not a physical thing. So it's, we can say it's unitless. Radian is not. Uh, you you can divide radians by, I don't know, by by. No. <laughs> a, a radian does not correspond to any physical quantity. Okay, it's dimensionless in physics. Uh, so yeah, and you can see that these are equivalent. So we, it looks like we haven't made a mistake. I mean, it's not enough to say that we haven't, but at, uh, there's, there's a slight little thing that we've checked because this doesn't look nice for me. Now, if you were to uh, put in numbers, you wouldn't be able to check you wouldn't be able to check the units. So that's one of the things, one of the little things that physicists do, they try to obtain uh, the answer in letters first. 
Right, problem six. And we've done plenty of those last year. Uh, if you're interested, find the, find the corresponding uh, webinars from last year. They're all recorded, they're all there. Well, no, radians, no, radians per second, radians per second. Radians per second. So omega is measured in radians, radians per second, which is the same as just second to the power minus one. So radians omega squared is second to the power minus two. All right. A smooth support of mass M1, so this is a support M1, is resting on a smooth table. Uh, the support is a hemispherical cavity of radius R. Is, is it covering up? Uh, hemispherical uh, ca cavity of radius R. Uh, a small mass M2 is released and it starts sliding. Find the speeds of the mass and the support when the mass is in its lowest position. Find the contact force between the mass and support at this time. Support at this instant. Okay. Very good, very, very good, Henry. So conservation of energy, yes. What else would we need? What else? What other uh, areas of physics would we need? Conservation of momentum, yes. Plus momentum, momentum. And well, of circular motion, of course. Circular. Circular. So these are three areas of physics we're going to combine into one question. That's what makes it difficult. Okay. Um, right. So we have uh, we have we have a mass sliding. So. Because there are no horizontal forces, no external horizontal forces, no external, external horizontal forces, horizontal forces. So uh, momentum is conserved in the x direction. Okay, so what happens? Well, uh, when M2, when M2 is in this position and it's moving with speed V2, M1 must be sliding to the left, M1 with speed V1, okay? To understand the physics of this process, like why, why the nature of this, or well, because there's a normal reaction force. There's a normal reaction on M2, which pushes this way, and a normal reaction force, which pushes on, which is, which, Newton, you need to apply Newton's third law. There's normal reaction acting on mass M2. Therefore, uh, there's the same normal reaction force is acting on M1 in the opposite direction. And that force causes M1 to shift to the left. Okay, so M1 is pushing M2, therefore M2 is pushing M1 in the, in the opposite direction, according to Newton's third law. Normal contact force is always a two-way thing. You're pushing on the floor, the floor is pushing on you. So the mass M2 is pushing on M1, M1 is pushing on M2. So uh, M1 is moving to the left with 
speed v1 and m at, at the same time m1 m2 is moving to the right with speed v2 and we know that m1 v1 has to equal to m2 v2 now i'm not doing vectors here i'm just doing the speeds i'm doing scalars because i don't want to i don't want to get lost with the directions obviously they're going to be in opposite directions okay I just, I'm just not considering that. I mean, ignore, ignore, ignore signs because that's not important here. That's conservation of momentum. Now, conservation of energy. So mass M2 drops from a height H. Well, it is equal to R. So it has initially it has energy MGR. That's the in M to gr i'm going to use acceleration of momentum momentum energy energy and conservation of energy says that m g m 2 g R, MGH, M2GR, that's the potential energy at the top, is equal to the kinetic energy of the, of, at the bottom. So one half M2 V2 squared, that is the kinetic energy of the small mass plus the kinetic energy of the big mass, V1, V1 squared. Okay. And we use, we use that. Uh, now from, from the first one, we get M, uh, no, actually we get V, one, is equal to V2 times M2 divided by M1. And we sub, we sub that into here. So So instead of V1, uh, we put V2 squared multiplied M2 squared divided by M1 squared. Okay, it's a bit messy here, but uh, we can get, we, let's multiply everything by two and multiply everything by, well, M1 cancels. M1, one of the M1s cancel here. And I'm multiplying everything by, Sorry, I'll try another another way. Try another thing. Okay. Hope that makes more sense. Okay. Uh, so from here, we can write that, um, so we multiply this by two M1. 
and we get 2m1, m2, gr uh, equals m1, m2, v2 squared plus 2 v2 squared m2 squared and we can find v2 squared m1 m2 plus 2 m2 squared equals 2 m1 m2 gr and here we can get that v2 squared is equal to 2m1 m2 gr divided by m1 m2 m1 m2 plus 2 m2 squared. Did I make a mistake somewhere? Let's have a look. v2 squared. M2 Okay, let's see what we get. It doesn't look right, but maybe maybe we're just using a different slightly different method. Now, so M2 cancels here because M2 cancels. And we get 2m1gr, m1 plus 2m2, m2. No, I've made a mistake somewhere. Sorry. Uh, Oh, actually, you know what? It would be easier to, because there's more, a bigger chance to find the mistake if I. So I'm just going to draw like this and I'll try again. Okay, so we have M2. M2 GR is equal to one half M1 V1 squared plus one half M2 V2 squared. We know that V1 is uh, V2 multiplied by M2 divided by M1. We plug that in, so M2 GR is equal to uh, one half M1 V2 squared M2 squared M1 squared plus one half M V2 squared. And okay, you know what? I'll, I'll I won't do anything. I'll just do 2m2gr. I just multiply by 2. And m1v2 squared. So here, I'm going to take v2, v2 squared out of the brackets. So v2 squared, uh, m1, m, this is m2, m1, m2 squared, 
m1 squared plus m2 okay so 2 m2 gr equals uh, so m1 cancels you get v2 squared open bracket m2 squared plus m1 m2 divided by m1 so v2 squared is equal to 2 m1 m2 gr divided by m2 squared plus m1 m2 okay m2 cancels and you're left with 2 m1 gr m1 plus m2 Okay, I'll I'll have a look where where I where I made a mistake. So just cross this out. Okay, so we got v one. So we got v one. So that is uh, v one is v two. Sorry, is square root of two m one g r divided by m one plus m two. And V1 is, uh, we already know that it is M2 divided by M1 multiplied by V2. And all you need is to, is to write this down. So it is um, M2. 1 square root of 2 m1 gr divided by m1 plus m2 uh, so m1 kind of cancels here m2 it's going to be square root of 2 gr m1 m1 plus m2 um, and because that we will we we might have an issue later on yes because we will need to add those i'm going to rewrite v2 in a slightly different way so i'm going to write v2 as m1 multiplied by square root 2 gr m1 m1 plus m2 okay so that is uh that is v v2 you can see that uh, v2 and v1 are very similar v v2 and v1 are very similar uh brilliant now now we need to find the we need to find the uh the 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 reaction force so when it's at the bottom so when it's at the bottom of, of the of the track it's moving so this is moving with v2 but this is moving with v1 so if we go into the frame of reference of the if we go into the frame of reference of the support we will see that uh, this is v v1 plus v2 and this is zero so basically the relative the relative speed of the mass and the support is v1 plus v2 Right, and we have 
So in other words, I'm just going to delete that and say that this is V1 plus V2. Okay, now uh, I, can, I, look, I look at the forces acting. I have the normal reaction force and I have the rotational force, Mg. Now it is accelerating upwards. So we have Newton's second law. We have mass acceleration is equal to normal reaction minus Mg. So normal reaction force is Ma plus Mg, which is equal to M V squared, M V1 plus V2 squared over over R plus M, sorry, I need to be specific. We're talking about M2, 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 M2G. So we plug that in. We know that V1 and V2. So it's gonna be M2 divided by R. I'm going off screen. Uh, M2 divided by R, uh, and this V1 plus V2. V1 plus V2 is simply M1 plus M2 square root, or, or no square root because it's squared. So 2GR divided by M1, M1 plus M2. How I messed something up. Yes, it's M1, M1 plus M2 squared uh, plus M2G. Okay. Here we have the normal reaction force. Normal reaction force. So N cancels, M, M1, M1 plus M2 cancel, R cancels. Uh, so we have M2 over M1, M1 plus M2, 2G plus M2G and Simplify that equal to well okay G open bracket I'll take G over M one open bracket uh, M 2m1 plus 2m2. Sorry, I'm skipping steps here, but I hope you can watch the video or just go through the notes and, and figure it out. Um, one, so m oh, m2, of course. Sorry, getting messy. Uh, uh, M1, M1, so that is M2G over M1, uh, 3M1 plus 2M2, okay, open brackets, it's going to be 3M2G plus Yeah, plus two, 
uh, m2 squared over m1g. Okay, and this is the answer. Right, I hope that makes sense. Anyways, yeah, from the first equation, uh, how did you go from the first equation for V2 to the final equation showed a V2, this one. So what I did here is I, um, I took M1, uh, I took M1, uh, uh, so basically I multiplied by M1 and divided by M1. Okay, so here you have, so I multiplied by M1 and I put M1 squared here. And then this cancels and it got 2GR divided by M1, M1 percent. Hope that makes sense. All right, uh, I have to go. Uh, we went over time as usual. <laughs> so hope, I, hope this, I hope this was useful. Uh, do let me know if, you have, uh, if, if, you're, if you're really struggling. I do hints in, in the chat. And uh, yeah, looking forward to your submissions next uh, next Sunday. Next Sunday, All right, well done. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. How did you get from m two v one v two all squared over r plus m two g to the next equation? To the next. Which one? Sorry. M two brackets v one plus v two squared all over r plus m two g. That one, yeah, yeah, that one. And then how did you? What did you do after that? So I, I just subbed, uh, oh yes, so I substituted, uh, because you know V1 and V2, mm -hmm. this is V1 and this is V2. Mm -hmm. So if you add them, V1 plus V2, they have the same term, the square root is the same. So it's going to be M1 plus M2, uh, M1 plus M2 square root of 2GR divided by M1. Oh, I see. M1 yeah. plus M2. And when you square it, mm -hmm. V1 plus yeah. V2 squared, you get this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I see now. Yeah. And just, and in the second one, uh, that's, it looks like quite an easy problem in the actual assignment. It's only worth two marks, but problem nine, where it's about this, these physics students on the train from London yeah. to Oxford. Um, I can figure out the pendulum, but I can't figure out the balloon. The balloon is what's really troubling me. You can assume that the balloon is massless, if that helps. Oh, okay, thank you. You can ignore the uh, the gravitational force on the balloon. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, welcome. All right, see you everyone.